Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. This episode may contain explicit language. Welcome to Karen Feeding, the show where we parent together. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 12, Oliver, who's nine, and Teddy, who's seven. We live in Tokyo, Japan. I'm Zach Rosen. I make another podcast. It's called The Best Advice Show. And I'm dad to six-year-old Noah and three-year-old Ami. We live in Detroit, Michigan. Hi, I'm Lucy Lopez. I host the Mamacita Rica podcast. I'm mother to Amelia, who's 13, Avery 11, and we live in Miami. Today on the show, we're talking about polyamory and parenting. Jess Daylover and her metamor, Ash, are co-hosts of the Remodeled Love podcast, and they'll join me to talk all about parenting in a polyamorous family. We'll also share a round of recommendations. And then if you're in the Slate Plus Club, Jess and Ash stick around for a game of parenting yays and nays. Here's what you'll hear if you have Slate Plus. Okay, here comes a here comes a very divisive. <laughs> oh, Lordy. All right. Telling children the truth about Santa Claus and other holiday figures from a young age is more honest and beneficial. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I absolutely agree with that. And guess what? I'm a hypocritical POS because um, I, again, thought I was going to be the crunchy mom that was like, we don't lie to our kids because then they are heartbroken later when they found out you lied to them and it's not real. And then I saw the magic and the joy of them getting into the story and I have completely bought into it. And so I think what I'm doing is wrong. And I'm doing it just so everyone knows. And Ash refuses to do it. And so Ash has had to walk this. How does that work? I will let her tell you. (laughs) It's called semantics. If you're listening on Slate Plus, thank you so much for your support. We'll catch you later for your exclusive segment. If you're not listening on Slate Plus, we hope you'll consider it. There's no better way to support the show. And when you're a member, you'll also get ad-free listening on all Slate podcasts. Sounds great, right? We think so too. Go to slate.com slash care plus for more info. Or you can just subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts for a little less money. The choice is yours. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll see you back here in a minute. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make that a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Therapy has helped me recognize yellow flags in situations that perhaps in the past weren't as obvious as they are now. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and it's designed Designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash karenfeeding today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash karenfeeding. There are stories about my mom's life that I never get tired of hearing. This Mother's Day, I found the perfect gift to capture them all. It's called StoryWorth. StoryWorth helps you preserve precious memories and stories from your mom for years to come. Here's how it works. Each week, StoryWorth emails your loved one a thought-provoking question that you get to help pick. Questions like, who are your favorite artists? What personal expectations do you hold yourself to? What things do you think you cannot live without? Do you have any regrets in life? All your loved ones need to do is respond to that email with a story. You'll be emailed a copy of your loved one's response over the course of the year. You'll get to enjoy their retelling of the stories you already know and be surprised by the ones you didn't know. After a year, StoryWorth will compile your loved one's stories and photos into a beautiful hardcover book that you'll be able to revisit for generations to come. I got my mom this gift for Mother's Day a couple years ago, 
And it's one of the coolest things to have this beautiful published book of so many of her stories and memories. This is the gift for your parent. Give all the moms in your life a unique, heartfelt gift you'll all cherish for years. StoryWorth. Right now, save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash Karen Feeding. That's storyworth.com slash Karen Feeding to save $10 on your first purchase. We're back and it's time for my interview with Jess and Ash of the Remodeled Love podcast. So just to get everyone on the same page, Jess and her husband have two children, but they're polyamorous. So those four also live with Jess's boyfriend and her husband's girlfriend, Ash. Together, they make up a polycule, basically one big blend of a chosen family members. Incredible. I do want to urge listeners to put whatever they think they know about polyamory to the side and just let Jess and Ash explain how things are working in their family, because fundamentally, they're actually doing what so many of us desire to do, which is build a healthy, Mm -hmm. loving family. So with that, here's my discussion with Jess and Ash. I think the best place to start is a brief overview of what polyamory looks like for you guys currently. So like who's in the house? How does it work? practically um just kind of giving us a that for people that don't know you the like window into your world of the of the current family structure so my disclaimer before describing our polycule is always that polyamory looks different for everybody so if you do not know any polyamorous people in your life and you've never heard of polyamory don't know how it works please understand that we are just one tiny <coughs> type of way that you can do polyamory. This does not represent the entire um, culture at all. So in our polycule is me and my husband. We have been together for 14 years and married for 10. We and polyamorous for 10. We became polyamorous months before we got married, actually. Um, And our six-year-old and our three-year-old and my metamore ash on the call with us uh people don't like the term sister wives we use it as a joke I like, but it has I a, like sister wife but okay <laughs> we like sister wives and that's how <laughs> we are in each other's phones but there's a lot of cultural weight yeah. to that term so we don't use it um and my boyfriend is who lives in our home and how Like, if you just had to describe how parenting works for you guys, is is everybody parenting? Are there primary parents? Are there, like, that's like a very complicated question, simplified. But is there a way that you can kind of, like, are you working as a team all the time? Are there primary and secondary parents? Yeah. Well, we are definitely (laughs) navigating the interesting waters of a blended family that I think anybody out there who has gone through divorce and then remarried and the like what role does the step parent play in decision making and is that fair and and you know the the very difficult journey for the step parent Mm -hmm. um so I'll give my answer and then I'll let Ash um kind of play off of that so from my point of view Um, We have a really unique situation in which we very much are still have a primary parenting setup in a way that I think is efficient, but also has a painful side, especially to Ash. And um, my partner is more, much more of a fun uncle. So he is, well, but he's also so very much a dad Mm -hmm. like let's be for real you know (laughs) like those kids are wrapped around his little finger but you know he has he maintains his autonomy right so he um can do whatever he wants after work you know there's no expectation that he's home but i can call upon him to help if i need it if he gets overstimulated or tired or is sick with the flu he can be up in his room and he can sleep the entire three days and never once have to parent. Um, and so he, he maintains his autonomy and his boundaries. Um, and in an interesting way, he's also not super confident in his parenting abilities. And so I think he maintains a little bit more of a he shows up the best way that he can. Whereas I would say Ash is much more of another mom 
in a, you know, stepmother, blended mother, you know, bonus mom type of way. But I also know the hierarchy present um, also stands in the way of that for them. So I'll kind of let you go from there. Yeah, I think I would say that as far as of the four of us, I think Jess, Joe, and myself do more of like what you would maybe think of as like traditional parenting as far as the role with me having less, less time for sure. A little bit less say in decision making, which is honestly like how I would expect. And I think even when I came in from the very beginning, I was like, Hey, like, even if, even if they were to want to, that's not something I would have wanted. Cause that takes time as far as like building up, you know, rapport with each other, um, building up like your collaboration chops with the specific family dynamic that you're jumping into. And my background is being a nanny too. So um, there's like some crossover and some similarity, Um, And then also there's just, you know, the very important piece of like your bond with the children, just like being a child care provider, like that takes time. So it's not just something that I would feel comfortable like jumping in on and trying to be like some 100 percent. I'm your new mama. Um, (laughs) Here I am. (laughs) Type thing. So, you know, we've just kind of um, ebbed and flowed with different um setups depending on like all the different relationships involved and depending on comfortability of everyone so it 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 has ended up looking very different in different seasons for sure Jess you talk on Instagram too about how Ash like sometimes almost knows what to do more I feel like you have some videos where you're like she uh, actually has this I like sense of parenting or sense of what to do in these situations that sometimes you don't is that a fair characterization (laughs) well i will be the first to tell you ash is a better mom than me and (laughs) and they like to roll their eyes at that a little bit and i am saying it to be you know uh to to bring you in on a uh, it's a storytelling tactic right but i also fully stand behind it and i can give you my theory on that first of all you know, Ash came in, um, you know, we had just survived living in a nuclear family with a toddler and a medically complex newborn in a pandemic, completely isolated from any help. So when, by the time Ash entered the picture, she just had more spoons. If anyone's this a spoonie, you know, have spoons, yeah, has more energy, more, more capacity, more, was less burnt out. That is one huge piece of it that Ash is the first person to remind me of every time I say you're better mom than and I'm never ever saying it from a pitiful poor me martyry place I'm always saying it from a grateful cheeky place um secondly so they have more bandwidth they are less burnout secondly you know when um you birth your kids they are literally your biological product they they mirror you they show you your deepest wounds and your shadows and the epigenetic trauma that you have passed on you know so my kids trigger me in a way that they do not trigger ash and therefore ash is able to maintain her balance in situations where i might really be forced to move into my stuff not saying that does not not happened to her because I think the universe is still bringing you stepchildren, adopted children, whatever, village children that are still there to show you a piece of yourself. But it's just, it doesn't hit quite the same. It's like when you're able to maintain your regulation when you're taking care of another kid (laughs) versus your own kid. Like they just don't use, lose their regulation um, maybe as quickly as I do. And then the third reason that I say Ash is a better mom than me is because they just literally have more parenting knowledge and it is a much more of a passionate thing for them. So they have studied parenting um, stuff growing up. And so we believe in collaborative, gentle parenting. That is our parenting philosophy, all our entire household. And they literally just have more education in that. And so, yes, there is hierarchy when it comes to final decisions for our kids, but we are truly simpatico. So it might not be that Ash can make the final decision, but very rarely, uh, because like Ash will call us in, my husband and I will call us in and say, hey, I'm seeing you guys do this in your parenting. And I don't think that's in alignment with how you guys want to be parenting. It doesn't feel good to me. It's not working for the kids. This is what I'm seeing. And this is where I think you should improve. Or this is a decision I think we should make if I, if it were, you know, my bio kids, I would make this decision. And we're like, you know what? You're right. Let's do that. Yeah. And I also think that's something that like we all kind of do with each other. And that's one thing I really like about this co-parenting dynamic with all four of us is that there's no qualms about kind of gently 
stepping in. Um, especially if you see someone like acting, you know, out of alignment with like what their ideals are or what they have expressed, um, for that season, like their goals are. Um, and especially if it's something that is like, um, maybe negatively impacting themselves or, you know, the household. Um, so I think, you know, there are times where I'm like, not as chill as I want to be and just like, <laughs> That just kind of like steps in other parents Ash. <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it because ash is the w- definitely the more gentle parent and just like i said because like my husband and i will think that we are successfully gentle parenting and simply because ash has more education on gentle parenting collaborative parenting will point out actually that's not what you're doing. Actually, you are enforcing a consequence and you're manipulating them through emotional manipulation, but you think you're not, you know? And so yeah, there's just more experience there. It's it's such a blessing. How did those conversations go without hurt feelings? Because I, I mean, I think that's, I would say when I look at like questions that listeners write in, right? Like we get a lot about what to do when your partner is doing something like handling a parenting situation you don't like or a friend is handling a parent situation you don't like. And I I do know that what I see here, and of course what I see on Instagram and get through the book as well, is this idea of like, you're in a, a loving relationship, the entire family. And so it's when you know that advice is coming from that place, it's easier to take. But it seems like you guys have a lot as a family of like communication has to be really high in this situation. So how are you setting aside time to have these conversations? Are you pulling people aside? Like how does this go when when someone is parenting a way that it Ashley like he said doesn't meet their goals? I think that this as far as like how you pull someone aside or how it looks like it has looked like and continues to look like different things. So earlier on, we used to have really consistent weekly meetings, like family meetings where we would go over a lot of different things. Like where each person in the, in the, each adult would check in with, you know, how are you doing as an individual? How are you doing in the relationship? How's the household stuff going kind of from like a administrative place and like how is the parenting stuff going so we like reevaluate and there would be like a space to share um like successes concerns um curiosities um and I think at this point we don't have as much of the weekly family meetings even though we want to get back to them but we have developed a dynamic where we can either say something in the moment that's really quick and we trust each other and we take a lot of time to build trust. So for the most part, it's not like a, how, how dare you say I'm parenting like this? Like you need to butt (laughs) out. Like there's not actually, that's never happened. Um, for the most part, like, even if it's something that like someone disagrees with to some extent in the moment, um, I think we're really good at taking a step back and then regrouping later and having a more like in-depth conversation and checking in. We use a lot of nonviolent communication techniques um, from uh, Marshall Rosenberg. Um, we're not perfect at it for sure, um, but it's just a way of approaching conversations where it kind of takes some of the defensiveness and the offensiveness out of communicating um, and getting to like the root of the matter as far as what your needs are and also getting to what you're seeing and observing and um, fostering uh fostering uh, more understanding um, for each other. Yeah, I'm, we just live with an extremely high level of emotional intelligence. And to be polyamorous, you really have to have a high level of emotional intelligence if you're going to thrive and to do it well. And so we have spent, I mean, I have spent the last decade working through core wounds, attachment things, inner child stuff that prevented me from from practicing nonviolent communication prevented me from taking feedback where I was always operating from ego, operating from wounding. Um, The second that you tell me something about myself that I feel shame about, I'm going to move into one of my control dramas where I'm going to deflect or turn it around on you or get defensive, or I'm going to move into my rejection sensitivity and start, you know, manipulating or playing games or playing the victim or being butthurt Mm -hmm. um, in order to feel powerful and get control back in the situation. And it's, it takes a lot of work to get here because you do have to work through those core wounds. It's a lot of therapy. It's a lot of coaching. It's a lot of education. But then once you get there, we gentle parent our kids and we gentle parent each other. 
Yeah, I mean, I think so often we do this with our kids or we're willing to do it with our kids, but it's a lot harder to do it with like ourselves and our partners. So I think, you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me about the polyamorous relationship is like you have to, I mean, Jessica, like you said, what other choice do you have? <laughs> You're, you want to be in this loving relationship with these other mm-hmm. adults um, and these children, like you are going to have to learn to to communicate effectively. Yeah. And, and I would say like, if you want a healthier dynamic, because uh, the one uh, slight disagreement I have is like, I don't think you have to be highly emotional, intelligent, be polyamorous. I know lots of people who aren't, but I think definitely for the type of dynamic that I want, which is like healthier feeling to me, um, less stressful, less chaotic, um, less like like toxicity requires a high amount of emotional intelligence. I, this leads nicely into this, um, kind of a discussion about the polycule. Am I pronouncing that? Right. Because in your book, you, um, write this beautiful thing that I pulled out because it's lovely like however the definition of polycule seems relegated to relationships that involve sex romance or other forms of intense connection beyond friendship but for us our polycule is defined by our inner circle our close friends those who opt into being a significant part of our children's lives and those with whom we survive capitalism and parenthood by forming daycare and child care cooperatives um and now of course that has i i know your family situation has also evolved since you've written that but i read this with such like even as a monogamous parent i feel like this is what i'm always striving to create is this community of people who are here for me and my children based in this foundation of love right that we all love and respect each other it just seems like such a wonderful way to pair like the it takes a village in in the most like loving encapsulated um form do you I would love some examples of how that plays out in your family and the advantages that you guys see from from having this this really curated polycule what a great line to pull out and um remind me to talk about the app that I'm building to help folks find build and sustain their village uh because that's probably the biggest thing that I'm doing right now that I would want your listeners to know about um I think my answer to that question is, well, and it leads into something that might be a little too much for this podcast, but once you get into polyamory, you're just one degree away from discovering something called relationship anarchy, which is not attached to polyamory. You can be a monogamous relationship anarchist, but relationship anarchy is when you really start to question the cultural uh, imperative that you know, romantic love is the thing that you should strive for in your life. And when you do find a romantic partner, you should be sexually and romantically exclusive with them. And that relationship should sit on top of a pyramid where it is the most important relationship in your life. And everything below that is less important. So you're always putting your romantic sexual relationship first and everything else is below that. But what we actually find in relationship anarchy and definitely, you know, in polyamory, some of us, is that, well, what does it even mean to be a partner? Because my, you know, most trustworthy long-term relationships are with my girlfriends, my best friends, right? Absolutely. This is, right. Yeah. And so we're starting to see a little bit of a cultural shift where we're starting to question, well, should we decenter romantic relationships from our lives? Should we be focusing on all these other relationships that are going to be there for you in and out of your season, whereas most 50% of marriages end up in divorce, you know? And so once you start to really, well, what is a polycule? And is it really just the person I'm having sex with or have a crush on or we cuddle sometimes, um, especially when you start to factor in demisexual or asexual relationships? So plot twist, my husband and I have Uh, migrated into a non-sexual dynamic we no longer have sex that is not on the table for us but we are still very much partnered in love that is without a doubt my husband till the end of time and to circle back to your question once you start to question these these very fuzzy lines these are borders that we made up right? All borders in the world. (laughs) Geographical (laughs) borders are just made up lines that somebody was like right here. And so once you start to question one border, they all get kind of fuzzy. And then what you have is a village of people. So when my child is crying, who do you need right now? So uh, my kids call Ash sis. 
um, because that's what she and I call each other. And then very quickly, they wanted to call her that and they want her to call them that. So, you know, do you want mommy? Do you want sis? Do you want daddy? Do you want Dr. M? Dr. M is my partner. He is anonymous on my platform. Um, who do you want? Who do you need right now? And and who feels safest to you right now? And if one of those parents is tapped out, if we don't have it to give, if I cannot hold space for whatever you're going through right now, can I tag out and tag somebody else in? So to answer your question, the benefit is that the burden of raising children in this hellscape is spread out amongst more people. Because I'm sorry, but the ratio of raising kids needs to be at least three to one. Like, at least for an autistic person like me who is already overstimulated and burnt out from being a full-time working mom, I have my own chronic health issues going on. And so to in order to do this, people need to be able to lean on each other. And kids also need to have a non, in my opinion, can benefit from having a non-hierarchical relationship to other adults in their home. So I've been told before uh, you know, by a friend of mine that it would wreck her if she ever heard her child call someone else mom. And I was like, man, because that makes me drop to my knees in gratitude that there's another human being that wants to call, that my child wants to call mom. And it's just, it's just a difference in wiring. So. I think that's wonderful. What are some of the common misconceptions about polyamory and parenting that you would want to address? Oh, boy. Well, for some reason, according to the internet (laughs) and my TikTok commenters, (laughs) um, people just because it triggers something so deep inside of people who haven't been poly educated or anything like that. um, It, you know, people think polyamory is all about sex. And for some people, it is. That's a huge piece of polyamory for them. Uh, For other people, it's a normal amount of sex and for other people there's no sex involved at all um there's a lot of asexual polyamorous people just saying um so people get really really uncomfortable um that i don't know people think oh so they're having orgies in their living room while their kids are upstairs or something like that like we're still just really good parents we have normal boundaries that normal people normal healthy people would have around or like people assume that we are first of all that sex is is not appropriate and the sex being had is not appropriate and also that we're introducing our kids to partners who are then leaving every two weeks. And yeah. um, we are not really that different than someone who is monogamous, got divorced, and is now out in the dating world and maybe has a six-month wait until a partner can meet their kids or it's just an emotional milestone that needs to be met. Um, So people automatically project that polyamorous parents do not have boundaries that for some reason they project that monogamous people do have. They just assume that we don't have it. It's super frustrating um, and also offensive. Yeah. And like we have, we have like spoken guidelines as far as, you know, people meeting our kids and they kind of, I think we're just like all on the same page for unspoken things too. Like none of the four of us are bringing in any new person like within the first few months <laughs> of that person being in our lives because not from a safety perspective, I'm not dating someone who I don't think is safe for my kids. Like that's just a no go. So I don't, that particular thing that comes up is really confusing for me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like why, why would I be safe with that person if I think that they're unsafe for my kids? <laughs> right. um, but then I think just from, uh, and, and then there's this other piece where it's like in your daily life, as you're like navigating throughout the world, like your kids come into contact with their greater community. And we have people who are our neighbors and the next year they're not our neighbors. Like we have like kids who uh, go to school with you, but then they left the next like semester, like in some ways there's this like flow of relationships that happens. I think what's most important is that the primary people in your kid's life, um, namely the parents um, are stable, like in healthy and doing their Mm -hmm. best, um, to work through things. It's not as like, because what does that say about military families or, uh, traveling artists, right? Like are all of their kids messed up? Like, no. (laughs) Right. I mean, People, people like to make things out of yeah. everything. I mean, I I think that was one of the reasons, you know, we really wanted to have this conversation was just to be able to say, look at what this looks like. And I mean, Jess, that's one of the reasons I love your Instagram account is sort of like, 
look at what we're dealing with. And so much of it is similar Mm -hmm. to what, you know, a monogamous or a different kind of blended family. But there's also these other things that that are, you know, specific to polyamory. Um, But there's, I, I think they don't carry any like different weight than the kind of specific things that happen in a monogamous marriage, right? Like, or in a monogamous relationship or in a, you're a single uh, parent, all of those carry with them their own kind of challenges. Yeah, totally. And for some reason, people just get really, they don't understand that they're triggered on polyamory and that that trigger has like negated the, the critical thinking. And then they don't realize they're projecting and they don't realize their projections contain a bias inherently. So let's, let's take, for example, one of the questions we get the most So you're just bringing partners in and out of your kid's life that would devastate them, that would make them feel unstable, and that would hurt them because they're going to lose connections. And so, first of all, this question contains the belief that polyamorous relationships are going to fail. And so because someone is has not unpacked their mononormativity, their belief that anything that is not monogamous cannot possibly last. Mm-hmm. Um, they're automatic. The question automatically assumes certainly your polyamorous relationships are going to end with a breakup and then your kids will be harmed by that. Secondly, it assumes that even if there were a breakup, because of course we no longer attach the sustainability of a relationship to the success. Sometimes karma runs its course. Sometimes I have learned to break up with people while we are still in love because you come to realize this is no longer serving our highest good. And I think that we should Mm -hmm. end this relationship. But it assumes that just because you break up with someone that that person can't have a relationship with your kid. So when people say, so you're just bringing people in and out of your kids' life and that's going to create instability. Well, if Ash and Joe, my husband, broke up, Ash would not exit my children's lives. There might be right. there might be a denesting that happens that divorced people also have to work through. Um, but when you have an emotionally intelligent, communicative, and you have a village, when you have a village, it's not the weight of that rupture isn't felt so much. And then that relationship, they can still have the relationship. Just but I think a lot of times um, the semiology that monogamous people have is well when this relationship ends, it ends badly. And now we're going to play games with each other. We're going to weaponize our children. It's going to be toxic and dysfunctional. So there's no way that I would allow someone who was not a biological parent to continue having a relationship with my kid because it ended badly. That's another assumption that's happening. And um, the third assumption is that it's negative for relationships to end when actually your children are going to experience a lot of relationships that end Mm -hmm. as Ash laid out, whether it's a best friend moving because they're in, you know, their families in the military or you are in a toxic work environment or you have a friendship that has taken a turn teaching your kids to recognize the signs of a relationship that has run its course and being able to consciously and lovingly Um, de-escalate or draw new boundaries or straight up end that relationship um, is actually a really positive thing we live in we live on earth death happens here death happens literally in with our animals with people we love it happens in relationships it happens to systems and cultures and death is always happening and so part of this journey is about being death positive and seeing the end of relationships as something that you need to learn to consciously do Um, just like you need to teach your kids about sex, you need to teach your kids about death. And that includes relationships. Yeah. And and modeling that. I am sure that there are people listening that have a lot more questions. (laughs) So I want to take a second to talk about your book, Polyamory and Parenthood. Uh, I mean, my pitch for this book is if you've listened to this and wondered, like, how did they use the dating apps? How did they, how did this start? When did they decide (laughs) to be polyamorous? Um, How do you tell the kids and how do you tell the kids? Jess has written all of that in a, in a book. (laughs) If you are at all curious, you should uh, go, go take a look at it. I mean, I just think it is a really eye-opening glance at what polyamory looks like, again, for you guys. And you do a great job of saying like, this is how we come into this with these biases and this system. Do you want to give your your elevator pitch for the for the book as well? Sure. Well, um, there are three ways to get our book. Um, you can get it as a um, just an ebook, a PDF, 
at remodeledlove.com and click on book. Um, and that's actually a pay what you can. So that's a mutual aid pricing. So you can pay as little as $5 and up to $50. And so if you have more resources, we ask you to pay more in order to supplement those who have less. You can also order it in print on Amazon and through Kindle on Amazon. And we are working on the audiobook that is also coming. That's amazing. And where um, can people find slash follow you? So Instagram, TikTok, Remodeled Love, website, remodeledlove.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter too, but it's not a super used platform. We also have a podcast, which uh, <laughs> is just, so I my background is in radio. And so um, having a podcast that is actually popular and gets listened to is a deeply satisfying thing. And um, it's really fun because you go on the journey. It starts, you know, I am like eight, seven months pregnant with our second child. We start this podcast. We're start telling our polyamorous stories story you watch you go on this journey of with us of struggling going through heartache and breakups and meeting new people and all of these uh gr- all these growth things and then you know you get to witness you know Joe announces that, that he has met this person named Ash you know and that Ash is coming to visit and then you know uh, I meet my partner Dr. M and so it's you know it's quite a journey so that's just remodeled love on all listening platforms also, I don't know how we can throw it in or edit it in. Nuclear Fusion app. Thanks, sis. <laughs> I am building the app that I need. So it was um, something I tossed out to my platform semi as like just a good idea. Uh, there there should be an app where people who are seeking connections and seeking to build villages and, mu- and networks of mutual aid and care can meet each other. And people were, and I, I was like, I want to call it nuclear fusion because it's the fusioning of nuclear families and, and individuals. It's not just for people with kids. And people are like, wow, this is a really good idea. You should actually do this. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do a Kickstarter. We'll never get it funded. And we certainly did. We absolutely surpassed that goal last summer. And so we are currently in phase two of our build of our app, Nuclear Fusion. It takes a village is the slogan. And uh, the mission is to help folks find, build, and sustain their village. So not only will the algorithm introduce you anonymously to other people in your area who are individuals, families looking to build networks of care, we want to decommodify care. So the things you find on care.com that you got to go pay for, we're hoping to help people return to the village in the way that it used to be. Uh, So not only will we help introduce you to people in your area who have these same values, we will also have an entire educational arm that's teaching you the emotional intelligence tools, the communication tools, and and all of the wisdom that has always existed, you know, in indigenous um, tribes of how to live communally and how to care for each other communally. So um, that's on the way. We're currently fundraising for phase three, which is the coding which is our biggest, this is our biggest (laughs) push right now. I'm sure. So nuclearfusionapp.com has that information. As always, listeners, we want to hear from you. Have you thought about polyamory or other unusual co-parenting setups? Let us know by emailing karenfeedingpod at slate.com or by leaving us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. We're always curious to know what you think. We're going to take one more break and we'll see you back here for recommendations. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian-approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. Also discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snack, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today and fuel up for your springtime goals. We tried Factor recently, and we love the convenience of it. This isn't just like a home meal kit where they send you everything and you have to cook. You don't have to cook anything. They send you a box of delicious, healthy food. We got all vegan and veggie foods. My wife took it to work one day. We ate it for a couple dinners. Even my kids ate it. It was really delicious. Get chef-prepared meals on the table in two minutes with Factors ready-to-eat meals so you can get back to doing what you'd love to do this spring. Looking for gourmet meals? Try meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, and asparagus. Factor meals eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Simply heat and savor the good stuff. 
We're celebrating Earth Day all month long. Look out for the Earth Month Eats badge on the menu for our lowest carbon footprint meals. Head to factormeals.com slash karenfeeding50 and use code karenfeeding50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code karenfeeding50 at factormeals.com slash karenfeeding50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. All right, let's move on to recommendations. Lucy, what are you recommending? I'm recommending everybody go out to their backyard, if possible, and start growing some stuff. Um, All right. um my daughters and i are currently growing some uh jasmine um basil Mm, um thyme i I don't know what this flower is called in english because i only know it because it was my grandmother's favorite and she used to call it santo domingos and santo domingo is also another name for the dominican republic because she knows that those flowers are from there so whatever they're like little flat and they're usually white or pink um anyways we're growing that kind of stuff but then i thought well for people who may have you know like littles like little kids i highly suggest to going to kindercare.com there's an entire article about five easy edible things your kids can grow and beyond and you can start growing them like right now and they'll be ready by next month and we have um tomatoes carrots um you know stuff that you can see grow and it can be a really great experience between you and your child totally check it out um i don't know i'm big on gardening i come from uh, a, a family of farmers uh from cuba so this is like big in our house and if i can encourage anybody to go out there and touch some grass as a 13 year old says every once in a while please yes. do so yeah yes and all you need is a sunny window. You can grow a, a nice couple, few things, even if you don't have a yard. Mm-hmm. And and I've got kids, you know, my 13-year-old and 11-year-old, which you would think they would kind of like not be into it. Their favorite thing is getting popsicle sticks, writing what we're growing on it, making it all decorative. Like Cute. it's it's a big to-do in my casa. So yeah, big recommendation. Yeah, what absolutely. a great spring recommendation! I so love much that. fun. Yeah. And jasmine, I love that you're doing jasmine. That's so. Oh, enchanted. you should see outside. It smells so good mm-hmm. at night. I and, love jasmine. Oh, and we also have lavender because of the mosquitoes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that helps. Does it that work? helps. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Lavender and and lemongrass, right? Yes, lavender and lemongrass. We have lavender. We have to be careful with the dog that he doesn't bite at it. But um, yeah, I mean, I live out in the swamp. Miami is a swamp. So it's it's crazy out here. But the mosquitoes are the size of small horses. But the lavender have been keeping them away. So yeah, just thought I'd throw that in there. Anybody who's got that green thumb in them, now is the time to use it. Love it. Zach, what are you recommending? I've long talked about bridge songs on this show, songs that might be... um, you know, if your kids are just into kids' music, songs that might kind of get them to stretch out a bit and 
get excited about adult songs. And, you know, Noah has, since I started the show, she's really developed a, a, a good taste in music. She's been on a big Taylor Swift kick lately, which is fine. Um, but I'm going to recommend a song by the great country singer, songwriter Casey Musgraves off her new album. It's called Woo! Deep Fila Casey, too. Oh, I love her. This is like the most beautiful song ever. Isn't this? Sad. Yes. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Uh, we talked about um, on, on the last episode, I talked about my family going to check out the solar eclipse. So, you know, the, the words of that day were totally like wonder and awe. And then we listened to this song on the way home from that. It's called The Architect. And it's off her new album, Deeper Well. And it's basically this song where she is um, like reveling in in the, the majesty of the universe. And she says, mm. she says, even something as small as an apple, it's simple and somehow complex, sweet and divine, the perfect design. Can I speak to the architect? Oh. And, it, and there's a canyon that cuts through the desert. Did it get there because of a flood? Was it devised or were you surprised when you saw how grand it was? And so it's her... Um, you know, talking to the architect, the creator, whatever you want to call it, about like, how did this incredible planet get to be so incredible? And so it's just a song that will make you feel the feels of Earth. Earth Day's coming up. I, I can't recommend Casey Musgraves enough, um, but this song hits our whole family, especially, especially hard. Oh, I love her so much. So, so, so much. I mean, uh like the best deeper well oh my god come on <laughs> like that entire song is is like <gasps> oh the feels big feels. The feels oh yeah in my in my house we're in between casey musgraves and beyonce's uh yep. country album it's Same. like it's hit for hit hit for hit i yeah. mean amazing yeah, it's, it's a good so it's good. A good moment it's a country uh, we're gonna, summer we're gonna play this this morning country i think this will be our uh our Do breakfast it. song i Do love it. this elizabeth what have you got uh, I am recommending reusable water balloons, which huh. I wasn't really sure about, but we came across them at a, a like pool party here, and I immediately had to order some for like myself. So they're like um, for yourself, <laughs> for me. They're for me. No, I mean it's. I feel like my kids are at a weird age in the pool. Like they love to swim, but they're like beyond the dive sticks, but they still like want to do something. And this is like the perfect um, thing for this age. Uh, so they're like, they clasp with a magnet with a magnetic closure. So it's like two halves of a circle and you just like scoop the pool water and close them. And then when you throw them, you can actually kind of like play with them like a ball because they're a little bit hardy. But when they uh -huh. hit, they open and the water goes everywhere. So if you oh, were cool. like playing on the grass or something, every time they hit the ground, they, you know, explode. They hurt the same amount as water balloons. So this is not like if, if you have a child that doesn't like to be hit by water balloons, they're not going to enjoy gonna be hit being by hit by either. these. <laughs> yeah. But for my three, and yeah. like it's so fun, and we're playing with them as like balls in the pool, and it's kind of fun because when sometimes when you catch them, they like open. Um, I don't. They've just been like such a such a hit, and we can play with them on our small little deck without any of the you know balloon pieces that are everywhere, and I'm sure is bad for you know the earth, yeah. um, the creatures. So it's I don't know. Uh, we're big cool. fans of the reusable water balloons. I love that. I love All right. It. Well, we always want to hear what you guys are loving, listeners. So seriously, please reach out and keep the conversation going. And that's our show. Please subscribe, leave a rating or review, and tell your friends. This episode of Karen Feeding is produced by Maura Curry. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio. For Lucy Lopez and Zach Rosen, I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. Thanks for listening. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.